Hello everyone and Merry Christmas. Today I wanted to talk about starting a business breeding ball pythons. It certainly shouldn't be something that should be taken lightly. It is a lot of fun, but I think too many people get into this and don't understand how deep you can really go. Um, it is often described as an addiction, maybe like tattoos or something. Once you get your first one, you don't stop. It's a decision that probably involves maybe more than just you, although you might not know that yet. So today I'm gonna go over each step that I think is crucial to start a ball python business, some of which you do before you even start. This guide could quite honestly be used for just reptile keeping in general and maybe even animal keeping. But of course, I'm a ball python breeder, so that's what I'm going to kind of gear it towards, but if the shoe fits, apply it towards other reptiles or animals, because a lot of this will apply towards any animal breeding. Number one is research. This is the number one step that a lot of people maybe glaze over. They do a little bit, of course. More or less, they just get excited. They'll look at a video and they'll get excited and they think, well, that's research. There's so much to research. Number one would be the husbandry, obviously. This would be anything from the temperatures to the humidity, types of substrate. If you aren't breeding ball pythons, you should specifically research the breed of animal that you want. You should be researching even medical treatments whether you do them yourself or having a vet that is a reptile vet specifically nearby is going to be crucial as well. You'll need to research incubation, how you are going to incubate, what temperatures you need to incubate at, humidities. All these things are absolute necessities before you even get started. Prepare to watch a ton of YouTube before you even start doing this before you spend any money whatsoever you need to be watching tons of YouTube and that's a wonderful resource we have and don't just watch one youtuber but watch other videos of younger up-and-coming breeders of mid-sized breeders smaller breeders bigger breeders watch Justin's videos watch Royal Constrictors videos there's so much knowledge out there and some of it will slightly conflict and that is honestly somewhat okay because sometimes not all information needs to work for every person Find what works for you and utilize it. That's not to say that you still shouldn't do an occasional internet search every now and again, but I find that YouTube is a medium that I enjoy using to learn and to research all sorts of things. I've used it for more than just reptiles. I've learned to do fix-its around my house. So use YouTube to your benefit. I think that you should own a ball python for a while before you actually do get into breeding. A lot of people do get breeders quicker to fast forward this process. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but you just need to make sure you do your research. And I still would recommend keeping a ball python for at least a little while to make sure that you know the husbandry and such so that you're not making catastrophic mistakes with some very expensive breeders. Plus these are living creatures and we at least owe it to them to give them a healthy life. Number two would be your finances. You need to make sure this works for you and there's different levels you can get in at this on. You can get basic level stuff if you just wanna start very small. It takes a little bit longer, of course, but this is a good way to slowly learn anyways. So if you don't have a lot of wealth, this might be your only option. And that is okay too, because the hobbyist is a incredible way to spread love for this hobby of ours or business of ours or whatever you wanna call it. The smaller investments could be anywhere from 100 to 300. In our most recent video, we just talked about the ball python recession and how you can utilize that to get things a little bit cheaper, especially if you're entering at an entry level. Right now, pides, basic level pides and clowns are the cheapest they've been in a while, especially for females, so this would be a good time to do that. You could get a visual recessive still for decently cheap for females, so this would be a great way to do it. This is my recommendation if you're on a budget. You wanna be targeting females, specifically with recessives, and if you have to, you can do hets too. This will lower your chances in the future, but if your finances are where they are, you can only work with what you have. Dream big, but have realistic expectations. So if you don't have a lot to invest, you can still get into this, but you need to be smart about it and you're gonna have a longer wait time for the return on your investments. If you have anywhere from maybe three to $5,000 to invest in this, you can get in a little bit quicker, but always anticipate to reinvest your profits. This is what I've found. You can make money if you stop, but the money stops where you stop investing if that makes any sense. 
At some point, you can choose to level out where you've chosen where this is the max I can grow permanently or maybe for now. And that's when maybe you'll start seeing an actual return on your investment, but expect to always reinvest your profits if you wanna keep relevant as well, at least a bit. And then the final level would be into the 20 to $30,000 range, uh, if not more, maybe even taking out loans and stuff. This is crazy big money. This is crazy big chances too, especially this early. I don't recommend this for almost anybody. I don't even know if I recommend the second step for most people, maybe a mixture of the first and second to an extent, but the third step is for people who have a lot of money and time on their hands. A lot of people who I think would be more realistic is starting at the second step and building your way towards a bigger breeding business. The $30,000 range involves getting an actual place multiple, multiple racks, buying multiple breeders right off the bat and hitting the ground running. This ties back down to another thing. Spending money is not always just a one person decision. If you have a family, throwing that sort of money at something is irresponsible, in my opinion, unless you involve others in your decision. If you live with others, this is something that you need to discuss before doing. Uh, if they have any say in your finances, say if you're married or anything like that. But typically your cost of entry is going to affect your return on investment. That's just how investments work. But we'll get into how to best use your investment in a little bit. The third step would be to look into your local laws. You wouldn't believe how many people don't do this. Now, this doesn't really apply to ball pythons in most cases. This is gonna to apply to other reptiles, reticulated pythons, especially venomous animals. Any animal, you should look into your local laws and that includes city laws because if you're watching this from New York City, then I'm sorry, but the last I heard, you can't have ball pythons there. You gotta do your research but your HOA could try to do something if they find out. Um, if you live in an apartment complex, you probably need to make sure that your landlord is okay with this or knowledgeable of it and realize that they can change their rules at any time. And sometimes legalities don't matter. I know this from having friends that just recently had their landlords change things on them that isn't legal, but how are you gonna fight it? Another thing to do, which isn't really a law, but maybe it is if you're married, <laughs> check with the people who live with you. There's a lot of people absolutely terrified of snakes, and I've talked about this in our Halloween episode. Make sure that people in your home are okay with you keeping a bunch of reptiles. Four, get your supplies. Once you've made the decision that you're gonna do this, once you've checked everything else out, now it's time to get your supplies. You have to get this before. You have to prepare everything. This would be as something as obvious as how you're going to keep them, your enclosures, which in a breeding standpoint, it's far more efficient to have racks, but you do what works for you. Thermostats to control the heat. How are you going to heat them? Which most of the time it's gonna be heat tape with an underbelly heating source. Um, but if you're not using racks, it could be another form. You're gonna to need to eventually buy your incubator. You don't necessarily need to do this right off the bat, but you should be prepared pretty quickly especially if you're buying breeders because it's totally heard of that you buy a breeder that the breeder didn't know was gravid and suddenly you have eggs and you weren't prepared. Sooner than later, you need to get that incubator done. And this can be done in a lot of ways. You can buy a professional incubator or you can also make your own. And maybe we'll make a video about that someday as well. You're gonna need to decide what kind of substrate you're gonna use. We recommend something that holds its humidity uh, but doesn't get too crazy wet like cocoa husk, eco earth, something like that. And your food source. Uh, I've discussed this in a video before, but you need to make sure your food source is good. This might sound kind of crazy, but you should have access to live rodents. If you don't, then you're gonna have to go with frozen and they might not always eat frozen. So therefore you're going to have an even harder struggle getting them on to food. More often than not, if you're buying breeders, established breeders from another breeder, they will most likely already be on live and they'll look at your little dead, limp, wet rodent and not eat it. They won't recognize it as food. So you need to make sure that you have a source. Um, that could be you breeding them too, so that we could go down the whole rabbit hole there of what supplies you need, which would be rodent racks or your own little rack system, which is kind of what I use right now, where you keep them and breed them yourself to try to lower costs and have a food source. If you're gonna do frozen thawed, then you do need to have space in your freezer. Are your roommates or your spouse going to be okay with you keeping dead rodents in your freezer? If they do, then you found yourself a keeper. You're gonna need to get yourself a temp gun so that you can manually temp the hot sides and the cool sides. Just because you set a thermostat to something doesn't mean it's going to actually do that. 
So you need to make sure that you're monitoring that as well. Feeding tongs, you'll need those as well, especially if you feed frozen thawed. You're going to eventually need to look into how you're going to display your animals. Some people do this in simply simple deli cups. You can get the same containers I use for egg boxes as well from Walmart or at your local store for about two, three bucks as well, but they're kind of see-through, but they're also foggy. So I, I mean, think about how you want to display it. I recently invested in the next level displays and they're absolutely wonderful. But again, there's that word investment. So more money that you need to put towards this. Once you have all of your supplies, once you have your enclosures set up, once you have all your ducks in a row, then and only then can you look into getting your snakes. It's really important here to have a plan. This kind of ties into how much money you're gonna want to invest. If you don't have a plan and you just buy anything, you could spend a ton of money and be very frustrated. I did not completely make this mistake, but I did a little teeny bit myself. Just getting excited and getting something and saying, oh, my brain goes in so many different spots. You'll hear me in videos talk about how I wanna get this and this and this and this, and I do, I want to get everything but it's not plausible have a plan and control yourself and work towards that plan if you want to add more things work it into your plan if you want to work with clowns then you're gonna to want to get stuff with mostly het clowns you can get some breeders without clown if you're trying to go for clown but you're gonna to want to breed your visuals to them and that extends the process of how long you're going to need to work with this animal to get what you want because now if you have say a cypress and you have a clown and you want to get a cypress clown let's just say your female is the clown which is would be probably the ideal situation here if you want to get the cypress clown so she's the visual clown she's a full-grown breeder you take your cypress male and breed it to her now hopefully what you want is to get another cypress male because in about a year or two probably two that male will be ready and he'll be a cypress het clown because she was a clown. You will then probably honestly move on from your old male, which I'll get into that, but you will need to move on from that male because he's no longer as useful as what you've created, his son. That male is also a cypress, but it has the het clown. You breed that male back to the mom, which I know sounds gross, but then you have a chance at getting your cypress clowns. This might sound gross, like I said, but it is natural for them. It does not cause any major issues like it would in mammals with inbreeding. You're also gonna wanna have a range of animals. I used for my previous example, clown, but you're gonna have a range of different kinds of animals and that's also for different kinds of prices. So you're gonna wanna have stuff in the $100 range and under, honestly, to $400, a thousand. You don't have to do this, but I do recommend it, especially because again, I'm gonna tie this into something else. You don't have a name yet. So if you just start throwing out crazy breeds of expensive $5,000 ball pythons, that's a huge investment. And I don't know if you're like me, but when I'm about to spend $5,000, I wanna to get to know the person who I'm giving that five grand to. I want them to be my friend. I want to know that you aren't trying to screw me. I recommend building up your reputation. That does include having a wide range of prices in my opinion, because these will sell a little bit more often, I believe, and you can build yourself a lot more locally. You're gonna wanna get to know people because you wanna know the people that you're buying from, which is also great because you're gonna get new friends and meet new people doing this. You're gonna wanna get yourself a lifeline, establish relationships with local pet stores because you're going to be selling to them quite possibly but the biggest thing is is that find what genes you want to work with what genetics you're planning what combos you want what new things you might want to explore and stick with that you can make more experimentations as you go but you do need a plan or it will fall apart the next step would be market yourself. So many people ignore this. Establish yourself locally first is what I'd say. Doing shows as you start to do that, get to know people. Have another breeder as a sort of mentor for you. If you can do that, that is incredible, incredible lifeline. It's going to be important that you learn to talk to people. If you're recluse, certainly you can make amazing animals, but I see a lot of amazing breeders possibly suffer in this area. And it's not like they're mean or anything like that, but some people are more just to themselves. They just kind of make their animals and they're like, here you go. But if you can learn to market yourself, that's more than just the logo. That's called networking. So network with other breeders, get your name out there. And another great way to do that would be YouTube. That's why I started this so that people could see my face, quite frankly, so that people could start to trust me. 
so that the advice I give would help people um, so that I could have people see me and say, well, that guy's not gonna screw me over. Take good photos. Most cameras these days on your phone are phenomenal. We're filming this on a phone and we take a lot of our pictures with a Canon uh, because the color pops, but we've done some of them with the same phone. So it's not that hard, honestly, these days, but make sure your pictures look professional. Uh, we use a little photo box with the light in there. We got off Amazon for 25, 30 bucks and it works pretty well except for when they're too big. Hey, this is the editor here with a quick tip on taking professional looking photos. Utilize the rule of thirds. Go into your camera or phone settings and look for something called guides or guidelines. You're probably gonna need to look up how to do it, but you want to enable something that looks kind of like this grid thing here. This is called the rule of thirds. And all you need to know about this is that some really smart people did some research and discovered that when things in photos align with these four intersection points, it tends to be more pleasing versus something that aligns straight up in the middle. So you can see in this photo here from Canova, the head is lining up with this intersection point and a lot of the bodies are interacting with these two intersection points. Here's another example from one of our photos. You can see here it intersects with the head right here as well as this part of the body. And as a bonus, it also intersects the entire snake, but the main subject is right here. Brand recognition is the name of the game here. You need to make sure your brand is recognized and that again is not just a logo. It's more than that. Brand recognition is everything that I've said. It's how you present yourself. It's your pictures. It's how you speak to people. That is your brand recognition. The people's stories to who you sell and interact with is your brand. The main cost here will be time. There's not much money investment other than maybe your phone that you probably already own. You can expand on this by getting banners eventually as well. We've done that certainly, but even those have a minimal cost compared to that of the animals and the equipment. In this field, marketing is more important than zoology when it comes to the business side of things. Obviously, I think that there's a lot of knowledge, as I said that to begin with, with research that you need to have. You don't necessarily need a zoology or biology degree, but you do need to know your animal and know how to keep them successfully. But marketing is more important when it comes to the selling aspect of things. The next step is an easy and quick one, but I touched on it earlier. Learn to let go. These are not pets. You love them and that's why you got into this, but these are not pets to you. They're breeders. As I said earlier, there's a situation I played out where you had a cypress male and a clown female. You breed those together, you get the cypress het clown. When that male comes up to age, you no longer need the male father. It's time to let him go, sell him to another breeder. You have to learn to let go of your old animals. And this is something that I'm coming to terms with now, actually, even with breeders that I already bought. I don't want to let them go. I love them, but I'm going to have to let go and move on from some of these animals if I want to keep upgrading my collection, especially with my current limited space. I can only expand so much anymore. I can a little, but I'm going to have to learn to let go myself a bit more. And number eight, which is arguably one of the more important ones of everything besides researching, prepare for everything to go wrong. Be ready for your plans not to work out, for your dream snake not to be achievable, for it just to be very hard. If you're trying for something new, be prepared for it not to look any at all what you thought it was gonna look like. Females, you'll be told, are ready to go in three years. Don't expect that. Some people will even say, oh, they can be in two years. They can, but sometimes you get a female that don't eat very well and it'll take her a little bit longer. I have that right now where it's going to take her four years. I could, I might be able to breed her mid year next year and go off cycle, but is that even worth it at this point? Sometimes I've heard of stories where females have taken five to seven years to get up to size because they just won't eat properly or because they just refuse to breed. This can be infuriating, especially if you invested a ton of money in one animal and that animal won't breed for you. This is a reality that you have to prepare for. And this includes infertility. You could buy an animal that in all aspects is 100% healthy and you won't know till two or three years later that it's infertile. That is a kick in the nuts, but it is a reality. Is it super common? It's not, but you need to at least have that in the back of your mind with every one that you buy that this might not work out. They will sometimes skip years. You might breed them a year and then they'll skip the next. This happened to me last year. I had a female that I thought she was gonna go first. She looked like she swelled up. She looked like she was about to go. She stopped eating for a very long period of time, just like they do. And then just one day I was feeding my other animals. I went in there to go look at her and she just had that food response, that very quick lightning look at me. And I could tell she wanted to eat. I put the rodent in with her and she ate it. 
she skipped. That sucked. It was a pied female. I can't remember what I was breeding her to at this moment without looking at my records, but I know it was a visual pied of some sort. So it would have been all visual pieds and then it had some extra genes as well. I think this might have been the banana one, but it's a reality of things is that you don't always get what you want. They'll skip some years. They kind of do what they want. They're also known to be notoriously picky eaters. We've done a video on that even. If they don't eat to where they need to go, then they're going to likely need to skip because they need that weight on them to be able to bear young. There's also clutch issues that you can have and those are the absolute worst. If you get kinking or other deformations, maybe you just have a failure to thrive. To be honest, we had one today. This animal had eaten a few times. Its husbandry was great. It had access to everything it needed. It had been on food for a while, but then just kind of went off for a bit. I had to step in and assist feed once and everything seemed to be going fine. I remarked on this animal last night when I tried to feed it actually, that it just seemed a little skinny again and that I might need to step in and assist feed. Today we found it dead. Um, it's just the reality of things. If you breed, especially a lot, you're going to have animals die in the egg. You're gonna have animals never hatch. You're gonna have infertile eggs. You're gonna have kinking, which is terrible, especially if the animal can't live and you have to then have a plan to put that animal down. That's terrible. That means you have to kill it and you should do so as humanely as possible. And I'm not gonna get into that right now, but research what you need to do. Some of the more easy ways is to have a snake eating animal like a king snake. At least that animal will go to some use at that point. But these are things you need to prepare and think about because not everything goes to plan and you should come to that full realization and understand that before you start this, that all of your beautiful plans in your head, not all of them are gonna work. If you'd like to see some of our other videos that maybe I referenced in this, you can check those out here and here.